So the title of my talk is basically The Power of Sloppy Thinking. It turns out that uh, Dawkins is not really an atheist, and I see a lot of people have already been upset as Dawkins fans just listening to the title, which is fascinating because it actually makes the point very well that David was making in the last talk, in the couple of last slides of his talk, about the importance of slowing down your thinking and thinking critically, which of course is one of the missions of um, Free Society Institute and why they exist and why this conference is so important. It's amazing that people can get upset just looking at the title of a talk without caring for what the argument is that the speaker is going to make. So I hope that you will actually listen uh, with an open mind and that we will actually rehearse and role model the kinds of things that David was, was advocating towards the end of his talk today. To let the cat out of the bag though, my mission in my talk over the next 35 minutes before I take questions are several fold. Firstly, I'm hoping to piss you off both if you are an atheist and also if you are someone who's a theist. So it's a double whammy. I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> That's my first mission. The second mission is to make a serious case for why agnosticism should be taken seriously. As I said a little bit earlier on Twitter, as agnostics, we are the paragons of intellectual virtue. And often we get ridiculed as being fence sitters. But if someone calls me a fence sitter, then I know that you probably haven't been a philosophy student under Professor David Spirit's watch because you are just mimicking a popular phrase about agnostics, but you're actually engaging in sloppy thinking, not the kind of thing promoted by Jacques Rousseau. So I want to make the case for why agnosticism should be taken seriously and why it's an appropriate attitude to have on the question of whether or not there is a God as an alternative to, to both theism and also agnosticism, I mean to atheism. So, so those are the two big issues that I want to be able to establish in my talk. And I suppose the underlying mission here, but one doesn't, Jacques, have to be too literal about it, it is in a sense the mission of the day, is really to also demonstrate the importance of really just thinking critically about your own beliefs and asking, as David said, what might happen if I had to give up a belief? I was raised Catholic, I wasn't born Catholic, as Dawkins would remind me, and I had to give up my Catholicism and the world didn't come to an end. And so it's also very important for me as a implicit third objective of my talk, although I will say some things bluntly about it towards the end, to tease out what are the implications um, from an epistemological point of view, um, but also from a practical point of view, what happens when you're willing to revise some very hard beliefs at the center of your belief system that you might have, both as an atheist, but also as a believer, because of course, after this talk, we're all going to be agnostics. So th those are the different objectives that I have in my talk today. So let me get on with it, because actually, the title is just there to be sexy. I don't really care much for the details of what Rich Richard Dawkins has to say. And the reason is very simple. I think the guy is not a philosopher. He's very bad at doing philosophy. He's a pretty decent scientist and popularizing science. But what he engages in is some pretty poor philosophy, which is exactly why I'm prepared to say that I don't really regard him properly as genuinely committed to atheism. And in fact, I think that he is not necessarily the best poster child for atheism um, at any rate. Um, so he's provocatively in the title, but I'm going to speak more broadly to the thesis of atheism and then to um, theism and then get to agnosticism a little bit later. I mean, there's, there's a, one of the chapter headings, in fact, in the God Delusions has the wording in it that already gives away the fact that there isn't a deep commitment to atheism in his thinking at all. In, um, I, can't, I might get the precise wording wrong, but it's something to the effect of why God almost certainly doesn't exist. And I think that's quite a telling framing of that particular chapter. But it obviously raises a couple of questions about definitions, which we'd better get clear up front. What do I then mean, as you see with MacKaiser, at any rate, by these three big words that is the basis of today's talk? Atheism, theism, and agnosticism. Most clearly, I think someone properly should call themselves an atheist if they think the statement or the proposition, God does not exist, is true. If you think that statement is true, then you are an atheist. If you think that the statement, God exists, is true, then you are a theist. And if you think you don't have a basis for knowing whether it's true or not, it might be, but you don't have sufficient evidence to commit to a belief, then you are a paragon of intellectual virtue, or in short, an agnostic. <laughs> so those, for me, are the three different ways of characterizing it. Now we can squabble about the definitions, but one of the ways of avoiding sloppy dialogue it's just to make sure we're on the same page, okay? It's nothing worse than a fight for 30 minutes only to find out that actually we meant different things 
in the terms of the rebate. So for purposes of this discussion, that is what I mean by those terms, so we can run with that for now. And then ask what follows about the quality of my argument if we had to run with my definitions. So the interesting thing about the question, and I, I think the danger is that there might almost be something trivially true about agnosticism being the most intellectually responsible attitude to have towards God's existence on my definitions, but we can discuss that during the Q&A, is that it is obvious to go back to our first speaker's very first question, why are we here, that there are certain facts that are not available to us about how it all started. I mean, scientists can have competing accounts of how things are going, how things are unfolding, and that's a story that I can't, as a non-expert, have a viewpoint on, like David, because I dropped science at the end of Senate 7, and I was happy to get my A for history as an alternative. That's what I'm interested in as a social and political commentator now. So I'm not interested in the details of the scientific story. You know, it's, it's, it's very important um, that we then think through what the implications are of these uh, different definitions. And the one possibility is that there's almost something trivially true about... Um, agnosticism being the most intellectually responsible position on my definition. So the question is, what goes on in the work of science um, that makes some scientists, make folks like Richard Dawkins think that, that atheism is obviously the correct attitude to adopt on the question of whether or not there is a God? Well, the truth is that the details of science doesn't answer the question, how did it all start? It answers questions about how things actually work mechanistically and how things are playing out. And that does not give you a basis for asserting that the proposition God exists is a false proposition. It does not do so. There's no good epistemic basis for that claim. What you can ask, of course, are probabilistic questions. And I think one of the elephants in the room when it comes to this discussion, I'm particularly keen to know what any real philosophers in the room might think about this, is whether whether agnostics are closet atheists or whether atheists are closet agnostics, I think is one of the big debates that needs to be pried open in these debates about um, God's existence. Because the truth is, and this is the basis on which I accused Dawkins of not being a genuine atheist in the sense in which I have defined atheism, the truth is that the basis of their atheism is based on the probability that God does not exist. God probably does not exist, therefore atheism is true. That's basically how the reasoning go from premise to conclusion. And I think that's a pretty feeble basis on which to assert the truth of atheism. Because atheism surely has got to be more boldly stated as it is certain that God does not exist. Not probably God does not exist. And it seems to me that at best someone like Dawkins is committed to what I might then call a weak form of atheism. And I wonder those of you who casually commit to atheism, whether you actually commit yourself to a probabilistic conclusion about God's non-existence, or whether you take yourself to actually believe in something stronger. But if it is something stronger, then I want to know what the evidential basis is for the certainty. What is the work in the premises that is being done to ground that stronger conclusion? I don't think that there is actually certainty that underpins that particular conclusion. And that is my basis for saying that I think the assertion of atheism is an overstatement because, in fact, there isn't sufficient evidence to justify that particular conclusion. And it, it, it interests me more than the quality of the arguments in favor, to move to the second step in my talk, in favor of theistic beliefs. And I call them theism because I'm not a student of religion, but I want to capture with the word theism basically a whole range of different belief types that all involve believing in some sort of um, supernatural being that might be responsible as an alternative for the universe as we know it, a supernatural being that actually exists. Um, I think the weaknesses in the arguments for theism are far more well rehearsed than the weaknesses in the arguments for atheism. But the weakness in the argument for atheism, like I've said, is fundamentally because atheism ultimately relies on, at best, probabilistic reasoning, which, upon reflection, should strike you as a pretty thin basis for such an incredibly bold certitude in the conclusions of the atheist's actual
conclusion. The theistic arguments, and I don't know how many people in this room are actually committed to theism, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. I might be speaking to uh, the Dawkins Brigade today rather than ones who are truly committed to Christianity or Islam or other variations on theistic beliefs. But equally, the weaknesses in theistic beliefs are similarly structured from an, to use your pretentious word that you were scared of using, epistemological point of view, David, from a point of view of what counts as good reasoning in forming your knowledge, as we would say in philosophy, there are similar kinds of weaknesses in the quality of the reasoning of the person who is committed to her religious beliefs as there are in Dawkins' uh, weaknesses in his commitment to his atheism. And they really are very simple. And I think this is fascinating because they are the exact opposite excellent features that David pointed out makes science better than common sense. Not privileged, but better than common sense. Because if you speak to someone who's committed to their theism, the sources of their belief are often a basis that can very easily be intellectually critiqued often based either in reality just on the fact that it's inherited as a belief. You've grown up in a particular household that is religious and so it's a received belief. And then my question is, if that particular belief is received, then why is that a good enough basis for holding on to the belief? I mean, I'm not even sure if that counts as a good enough uh, basis for saying the belief is rational to mere fact that you have grown up with that particular belief. But if you push someone and you say, okay, beyond the fact that I was raised in a Catholic home, I was an altar boy at First Holy Communion. My grandfather at one stage thought I was going to be a Catholic priest. Uh, didn't realize that Catholicism was just my route to becoming gay. True story. <laughs> you might push to someone and say, independent of how your religious belief come about, can you tell me an evidence-related story anyway for what the basis is of your religious belief, your belief in a God's existence? And I have never, ever come across in conversations with friends or even academics who are committed to a belief in God's existence, any evidence-sensitive answer to that question. At most, I've had a discussion, although perhaps this is unsurprising in, in my philosophical circus, I've had attempts by people to defend faith as a legitimate source of grounding their belief. In other words, an acknowledgement that there's no empirical evidence, there's no other sort of, in the scientific parallel, an equivalent rational basis for belief in God, but that nevertheless, that faith is an acceptable method. And that I simply do not accept, because the same person, for starters, who accepts faith as a basis for belief in God's existence, interestingly enough, can't explain very very bizarre inconsistencies in their own belief set. Why, for example, is faith an acceptable basis for believing in God, but in other areas of your, your life as, a, as, a, as an agent who has beliefs, or as a human being who has a whole lot of beliefs, is, is it not an acceptable basis? Okay, you're not about to take some random medication if you've fallen ill on the basis of faith. So faith is not let off the hook as a basis for what is sensible when it comes to other practical decisions that you make. So why should there be privilege in respect of your religious belief? Why should faith not be subject there to rational critique? Why should it be ring-fenced? And yet, if you want to take some weird cocktail to deal with your asthma problem or with your hangover, then suddenly your faith cannot be ring-fenced in respect to that. So at the very least, there is a kind of schizophrenia in the way in which many people who believe in God's existence go about justifying their beliefs about God. And to me, it's ultimately just a signal that, you know, truth be told, I think it's because people do not want to do what David's second last slide said, and that is to think very carefully about a belief that they've held for a very long time and put it under critical scrutiny. And so we engage in all sorts of wayward exercises to make it immune from scrutiny rather than 
confronting the possibility that there's no good evidence in support of a belief, but because that belief might be very central to our daily lives, the emotional cost, the social cost of giving up might be so high that socially and psychologically um, it may be easier to engage in other sorts of defenses, like asserting that faith is acceptable, even though five minutes later, faith does not become an acceptable method in some other aspect of my life as a believer in the world. So that to me is interesting. So for me, religious belief in God's existence has never been compelling because the source of the belief have never been compelling. Faith has never been compelling as a method to sustain belief in God's existence. The fact that it might be a received belief has never been compelling. And the only possibility, which I will leave aside for the moment and come back to in my, my closing remarks, is a practical justification that has nothing to do with it, whether the belief is rational or not, but rather with the role that the belief plays in my life. In other words, someone might be, and I've only met one such person who has been prepared to accept that faith is irrational, but that having the belief does not disrupt their friendships, their relationships, their professional life, and in fact their belief in God has enabled them to live a certain kind of life that they regard as coherent, as happy, and not particularly weird, no more weird than my life as an agnostic or someone else's life as a hippie atheist. And so leave my irrational belief alone. Okay, It's more like a pragmatic defense, and they've been prepared to give up this incredible high standard that I seem to place on intellectual virtue, which I use you know, quite, quite sloppily for purposes of this public discussion. So they've questioned the standard, the burden of evidence that, that, that I have imposed on them for what kinds of beliefs are the only kinds of beliefs worth having, ones that answer to a certain level of evidence. And, and they've been prepared to say, I, I fail your standard for what you call epist epistemic virtue or intellectual vir virtue, but who gives a damn? There are many kinds of belief that are important in a, in a successful life. And some of those beliefs don't meet that particular standard. My God, a life would be unrecognizably human if it met all of your standards intellectually. Okay, so that, that's been one defense. I'm going to set it aside and come back to it. The only point I want to make here as a sort of mini conclusion at this, at this stage of my talk is that what is clear to me is, is that it's so interesting that firstly, for many people who are atheists who throw stompies in the direction of those who are committed to religion and religious beliefs in God, there isn't self-reflection on the quality of their own belief in God's non-existence. And I'm not saying, I mean, this is a complicated discussion. There's lots of literature and philosophy. I'm taking shortcuts here. I'm not saying that there aren't perfectly good, interesting responses that professional philosophers of religion can make to my response about the theistic belief being weak and relying on probabilistic reasoning. I'm not saying we can't have that debate. I'm sure a couple of you will have a stab at it just now. The only point I'm trying to make, which is a mini point, but I think in the context of today's mission, Jacques, perhaps an important one nevertheless, is that a lot of people who are atheists are pretty bad at self-examining their own belief and the basis of their atheism critically and don't hold it for very good epistemic reasons. Are you able to recognize that for some of you, your atheistic belief is based on probabilistic reasoning? Some of you might be happy with that anyway. Some of you who now discover that for the first time might wonder whether that is actually epistemically satisfying for you. So that's just the first point. And then the second point is those who are committed to their religious basis for believing in God need to think about why they want that, that part of their belief set to be treated with kid gloves. Why should it be ring-fenced from critical scrutiny but the rest of your life is not, not only is it not, not treated with, with kid gloves by other people, but you yourself don't treat the rest of your belief set with kid gloves. That for me is interesting. And again, that's where the power of sloppy thinking comes in. Are you satisfied as someone who believes in God that you have this schizophrenia, that you have different standards? 
for your non-religious belief than you do for your religious belief. Okay, so those, those are the sort of mini conclusions at this stage. So let me, let me say a couple of things about agnosticism. I, I mean, I love talking about agnosticism in part because it's interesting to me how it gets lampooned as fence-sitting. And I, I get where the lampooning comes from because I suspect the lampooning is accurate of many people who actually call themselves agnostic. I think in reality, some people who call themselves agnostic really, really are scared to, <laughs> to just be atheists because they probably still have a hangover from their religious commitments and the consequences of giving up on their religious commitments. So when you characterize someone as being a fence sitter, you may get it right in terms of accurately picking out how someone who has recently started wrestling with their religious beliefs are still wrestling and, and finding it difficult to give it up. It's a little bit like coming out as a gay person. It's sometimes easier to come out as bisexual. <laughs> sometimes easier to come out as an agnostic than to come out as an atheist. So that fence at the tag might actually, might actually be accurate sociologically of many people who call themselves agnostic. So I've got sympathy for that. Sorry, bisexuals actually exist, for the record. <laughs> However, there is a version of agnosticism that should not be susceptible to that kind of casual lampooning. Agnosticism is bloody serious as an intellectual position to adopt in response to the question, does God exist or not? And it's a position that I hope in elevating our discussion on this fantastic Sunday morning, we will, we will think about quite seriously today. I call myself an agnostic not because I'm scared to let go of my Catholic past. Hell no. I mean, I, I really, you know, I mean, I'm way beyond worrying about what my family will think if I had to tell them, you know, that I'm an atheist. They've had to deal with worse things about me. Um, so certainly, there's no such fear in my own life. But the reason why I'm committed to agnostic, agnosticism as Eusebius MacKaiser is because I genuinely, genuinely believe, and I may be wrong about it, but I don't want the sincerity of my, of my commitment to be misunderstood. I genuinely believe that this is the most intellectually responsible position to adopt. And I think agnosticism in general is misunderstood by especially a non-philosophical general public. Um, and unfortunately, I think it, it, it lowers the quality of debate on this particular question about God's existence. Because for many people, it's a non-starter. Because you think it's meek, you're a sissy, you can't make up your mind. Just take a position. And it's not, it's, it, it shouldn't be that. So I want to spend a couple of minutes doing my best, hopefully not doing any injustice to my discipline philosophy, and see whether I can summarize for you, just in two or three minutes, no more, what it is about agnosticism that should be taken so seriously. So the first thing I want to say about agnosticism is that, by the way, religious beliefs do not have a monopoly on the concept. Agnosticism is a perfectly legitimate concept to adopt, and it's actually adopted without being used explicitly as a word in many areas of academic, intellectual, and personal inquiry. So it's not a stranger as a concept. Agnosticism just means that you haven't yet committed yourself to a particular belief. And you haven't because the evidence before you haven't justified an intellectual commitment to the issue that is the subject of your inquiry. Nothing more, nothing less. That's all it is. Now, I don't understand why agnosticism should be bastardized. When I, when I say it's intellectually virtuous, given what I've just described in my 30-second summary of what it is, I hope you can see why someone who is really not hasty, someone who slows down their thinking, CF David, second last slide, if you are not hasty in your inquiry into a particular intellectually interesting pursuit, then why on earth rush to a conclusion? Because really, that's all agnosticism is. It says, I've got all the time in the world. I'm not going to hurry to a conclusion. I know I'm seeing these weird lesions. It's in the early 1980s. I don't know what the hell is going on here in San Francisco. 
But am I going to jump to conclusions or will I wait for this inquiry to take its place and eventually we'll give it a name, we're going to call it HIV and it causes AIDS. That's all agnosticism is. Withholding commitment And maybe I like that too much because I'm still single. Withholding commitment until the evidence justifies commitment in a particular belief. And it goes way beyond religion. And maybe that's one way for you to make agnosticism not a stranger in the way in which you engage your own belief sets and the world around you. By taking it out of the religious concept, context. And then maybe that's how you will warm to it. Okay? If you come across, you might have an hypothesis about what is the basis for a particular phenomenon you come across? You come to your house and it's all dear Makar. You probably think it's a burglar yeah, who's been there. You might have an hypothesis. But you slowly increase the certainty with which you commit to a story as the evidence increases. So you go from agnosticism to firm commitment. That is the story of agnosticism. And I think it should be part of the basic toolkit of anyone who is intellectually virtuous that they aren't scared to withhold belief, firm belief, until the evidence justifies it. That's all it is. Now let's bring it all back and then I'll stop here and take questions too. Why agnosticism in relation to God? Well, this is fascinating. And I want to come back to my, my one friend who believes in God who said to me, I can accept that I didn't meet your standard for this paragon of virtue bull that you're talking about. But so what? If I can tell you the practical role that belief in God plays in my life, isn't that good enough? Isn't that good enough? And I don't have a response to that. That's the most recent response to this position that I have, that, I, that I've been thinking about for the last year or two. Now, this is a, my own agnosticism um, is, is, is an ongoing debate I've had with graduate philosophy friends of mine for years now who've tried to convince me that I'm a closet atheist and I've tried to convince them that they're closet agnostics. But the, the pragmatism defense is interesting and I want to say a couple of things about it. I mean the first thing I want to say is I don't think many people who are actually religious will be satisfied by that. Um, the person who responded I think was just a well-trained philosophy student rather than a truly committed Catholic because I think many people who are actually religious want to believe that the statement God exists is actually true. They don't want to know that it happens to play some functional role in their life. I think that will be deeply, deeply unsatisfying to most people who are actually religious. But the second thing is, the reason why I am agnostic rather than atheist is because, and I used this word a little bit earlier when someone was overexcited on social media about my title, that I can afford, I, I said that, I mean, I'm using the word casually for public dialogue purposes. I can afford to be an agnostic rather than an atheist. Because the key issue here, if we push my critique about probabilistic reasoning, is that is Eusebius right that you've got to be certain that God does not exist before, before atheism is justified? And some people have challenged me and said, that can't be right. Because no one, including yourself, uses certainty as the only basis on which you form beliefs. When you make judgment calls about political parties, about your lover, about um, food you want to eat, we don't engage in that level of reasoning when we make uh, judgments and decisions in our everyday life. So why the hell should it apply to God? And so, yes, even if you're right that atheism is on the basis of probabilistic reasoning, so what? Probabilistic reasoning is not to be scoffed at. That's what we do all the time. Okay? So that's one objection I've had to my, my, my little pushback against um, atheists. And what I want to say in response to that is that I think that, um, and I, it's not a perfect response, but, and, and I want to put it in very subjective terms for me, as a, as a, as a singular subjective belief agent, as it were. I only, I can, I can afford not to engage in probabilistic reasoning if I don't think that the consequences for my life are going to be particularly dire. There's nothing urgent about committing to the two options, atheism and theism for me. I don't see that as an urgent choice practically that is imposed on me. 
in the same way in which if I am busy dying right now of AIDS and there isn't certainty yet about the latest ARV regime, there's only probabilistic conclusions about it, then absolutely I'm going to be a fool to say, wait for a higher evidential burden to be met by scientists in the lab. In that context, I'm going to make a pragmatic choice based on probabilistic reasoning. For better or worse, I do not feel the same kind of pressure in relation to the question whether God exists or not, and therefore I do not feel my atheist friend's pressure to succumb to their probabilistic conclusion and, their, and therefore their commitment to atheism. I'm more than happy to chillax and let those debates about whether God or not play out. It doesn't bother me emotionally, socially, it's got no consequences for me. And in that sense, there's a distinction for me between the God question and other aspects of my life where probabilistic reasoning will be crucial to my survival. In relation to the God question, I don't think it will be. And then the final thing then, what about the pragmatic defense, either of atheism or theism? I suppose I've got nothing to say to the person who is happy to accept that they are intellectually vicious, but belief in God plays a certain pragmatic role in their life. I mean, I think that's incredibly honest. Like I said, a lot of people who believe in God will not be happy with that reasoning. They'd want there to be not just good consequences of having that belief, they'd also want the belief itself to be well grounded in the evidence. So I think only very few Christians, for example, would be willing to say, I have a belief that is not intellectually justified, but it does really, really nice things in the details of my practical life. The last thing I want to say, just to tie things up to, to, to what I said was the third aim of my talk, which is our fear to revise beliefs that we are deeply committed to. My aim isn't really secretly to persuade people to become an agnostic like me. My aim is just to get people to enjoy living a more critical life. It's being self-reflective, as David was saying. And it's not unique to philosophy. I think sometimes philosophers were quite arrogant and think we have a monopoly on thinking, thinking critically about things. And I don't think enough atheists and I don't think enough theists allow themselves to play with their own belief set and to think hard about their beliefs. And you might still hold on to your belief. And I taught a philosophy for religion class at WIT two years ago. I don't think more than maybe 5% of the class changed their beliefs in any direction um, by the end of the course. What is more satisfying to me as a lecturer in that context is that I could see the progression amongst my students in terms of their capacity to reason reflectively. And I think that's what's more important to me. And there was one student who wasn't in that year, who was a mentee of mine, who was in philosophy, but um, had taken the course the previous year. And he had come to me and he had said, Eusebius, you know, I want to speak to you. I had done the course. I am convinced by atheism intellectually, but I'm scared. I'm scared of what it means for me because I've always been very religious. I've grown up in a religious household, and I've gone to some church here in Brownfontein as a student my first year, and I'm, I'm really scared of what the consequences are of thinking about, about my belief changing. And during the Christmas holidays, I tried to commit suicide as a result of, of being scared. Um, and I thought, my God, okay, I thought only our high school teachers have to be shrinks and social workers, but as university lecturers, sometimes you have that burden as well. And one of, one of my colleagues, one of our colleagues, Lucy, uh, at Vet said, well, I suppose in a very macabre way, he's evidence of one student who had taken his work seriously. Um, I, I said to him, and I subsequently changed the course in the way I taught it. Fortunately, we had this conversation before I taught the course to the next first year intake. And I included an extra module for the last week where we talked about the meaning of life in the context of philosophy of religion. Precisely to deal with the question David was asking, which is, what should I do and what might happen if a belief that I thought was true turns out to be false? Because I think one of the things that hold us back, and I know this goes slightly beyond the core questions of my talk, but I think one of the reasons why we are often headstrong in even thinking critically about a core belief like my atheism or my theism 
is because we're scared of the personal consequences for ourselves. And yet even there, sloppy thinking can get us down because he hadn't thought through what the necessary and what the not so necessary meaning and consequences are of atheism. And the assumption was, to use an old tired, another misused phrase in philosophy, if, you know, if God does not exist, anything goes. That you couldn't make sense of a value system, a personal value system of moral principles unless you have God as a source of value. And of course, I mean, he's now turned out distinction student, one of our, one of our best philosophy students at Wits University, enormously talented and um, a very happy atheist. And he goes around now preaching how intellectually unsatisfying it is and challenging people to justify how authentic their lives can be if the source of value is the man upstairs. Because he had to think through how much of a loss it really is emotionally and morally if you disconnect yourself from the man upstairs. He hadn't allowed himself to do that. And I think that is the power of sloppy thinking right there that we need to rid ourselves of. Thanks.